Well, there you go, boys. Cassisi with a tear in his eye and his hair messed up. He did get a bit of Powerade thrown on him, but no, look, uh, a very, very good win. And they needed that one, didn't they, just to bounce back? Thanks, Leo. We'll head back down to your shoulder when we get to hear a thought or two from a player in the Port Adelaide rooms. The power winners by three points. And sometimes you just need to get a win by any means necessary, Steve and Jamo. And given the power of lost their last three, four out of their last five, just to snap the losing streak and to get back on the winner's list. Well, there's no question. Uh, you lose that game and all of a sudden uh, there's a lot of doubts start to creep in. The crowd starts to lose a bit of interest. You have to go to Melbourne to play Collingwood. And uh, maybe even your position in the finals is starting to be in jeopardy. But now that gives Port Adelaide 13 wins, uh, 12 wins, sorry. And uh, that gives them probably maybe just slightly. Matt, does it jump them back over three out of finishing the top? It's going to be very tight. Yeah, very, very tight, yeah. yeah but uh, it certainly puts them on the same amount of points anyway. So uh, they're, uh, they're back with a, a real opportunity now to finish in the top four. I think uh, it's, you know, they, they did lose. I was just having a look at some of their, their season to date. They've um, lost three games under seven. So round three, they lost to the Kangaroos by seven points. In round 13, which was an absolute belt of Sydney, in, they lost by four points. And then they lost to Essendon on the Saturday night game by two points, so three games under the seven points. I think that would be one on the back of they've lost consecutive games, but to win a tight one for what the day was and how much they just needed a win. But conversely, too, I, I thought Melbourne were, were very, very good. Uh, they, uh, they showed glimpses in the first half and went in at half time, 13 points down. They came out and, and outplayed Port Adelaide. Three goals, two to one goal, three in that third quarter to be a two-point margin at three-quarter time and led the way by Jack Watts, Dom Tyson, and uh, in the end weren't able to get there. That quarter two will be at very, very close, and I think as much as or as pleased as Paul Roos would be with the overall... Um, I guess game of his side and uh, and how they played and, and how they pushed toward Adelaide here at Adelaide Oval. I feel that um, he'd be enormously frustrated and disappointed they weren't able to get it. But Adelaide obviously had the, the bye next week, so to get a win and then obviously set yourself for Collingwood in a fortnight's time, um, you can only imagine how important that was for Ken Hinkley when it was swinging in momentum. And, and I guess if you wanted one more to have a, a shot on goal, point Stephen that Jay Shills would probably be their man on most occasions. Yeah he was the player wasn't he? It was, uh, it was a good turnover that was created across the centre of the ground and then uh, I'm not sure the player ever kicked it to Shills but it was a good kick just to give him a little bit of head, a bit of split on his opposition and so often today Jamal we saw Jay Shields mm. the kick still and be really poor just uh, in front of him and back behind him so he had to go back into the opposition but um, was one of the few times that they were able to actually give him a, a kick to advantage and he went back and um, kicked his second goal of the day and, uh, and the one that really mattered. But uh, it was a real scare for Port Adelaide. It was almost for me like they got out to 30 points and they thought, oh yeah, we've got this. And they just relaxed a little bit and let the Demons kick three quick ones before half time. And, you know, if, if they would have held and gone in 30 points up at half time or kicked another one themselves, you would have probably thought that that was enough. The Demons wouldn't have come out. But... They let Melbourne kick three, go into halftime with the momentum, and they came out and, uh, and really controlled the second half, I thought. And we talked about that third quarter. I, I thought they, they were so dominant, but only kicked three goals, and that's probably been a bit of an indictment on Melbourne for the whole year, unable to kick a big score. And uh, they probably should have been in front. Port kicked a goal after the siren to go in, in two points in front at three-quarter time, but Melbourne probably should have been a couple in front at three-quarter time and it might have been a different story. Let's head on to the Port Adelaide rooms with Theodoropoulos. I've got Ollie Wines with you, the bollocking bull. Gee, he was uh, tough in the contest today and they've come out with a great win, mate. It was a bit, a bit of a tough game and you just needed the four points, didn't you? Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, there was a big focus from the playing group to, to really give um, Dom a good send-off and... Um, to be honest, we probably we're still probably not playing our best football, but um, look, we we um, grinded it out, and um, it was it was unreal to get a win for him and um, farewell such a such a great player for our club, and um, he'll, he'll go down in history as one of our most important and influential players. Pretty emotional moment, isn't it, mate? 
Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, for myself, I've only uh, only been here for 18 months, but in that short amount of time, um, Dom's been a bit of a father figure for me, uh, really guiding me along the way, uh, not just on the football field, but off the football field, how to survive as an AFL footballer. So, yeah, it's going to be really emotional to see him go. Um, he's a great mate of mine, and um, uh, it's a great mate for uh, forever. On the, on the field, uh, it seemed like a pretty hot footy early on and you managed to win a few contested possessions and Melbourne took it up to you, but then you managed to just get a bit of a break on him and obviously the Schultz just kicked the sealer. How did you see the last passage unfold? Yeah, I, I don't think we got a bit of a break on him. Um, I think they were, they were probably better than us on the day and um, they were ahead uh, a lot of that last quarter. So um, I think we were just able to grind it out, get, win the contested possessions. Um, I, I think we're, we had a big focus this week. We've been um, running ourselves down that a bit the, the last couple of weeks so it was good to um, get on top of that and yeah obviously Schultz that was a massive kick um, they're two great mates and um, I, I would have thought that Schultz was going back and thinking just for Don so uh, it was a great kick under enormous pressure. Up to you boys. Holy Steve Williams here mate congratulations that was uh, a real heart stopper you've lost um, three pretty close ones this season so to win win one by uh, a kick probably was quite satisfying. Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, our losses, we've, we've been pretty close, so um, it was on. The, it was good to get on the other end of one and um, get a win. Uh, it's probably not how we wanted to win, and um, we would have probably liked to be a bit more relaxed in, in the last half or last quarter, but uh, obviously we've got the four points, and um, we got a win for, for Don, so it was good. And 30 points up during that second quarter, and particularly really, really taking Melbourne to the cleaners as far as contested position went but then from that point on the, the Demons kicked the last three before half time and obviously went in with some momentum and thought that they were a chance to get back into the game. Yeah, definitely. What do you put that down to, the fact that you were able to to look pretty convincing and then all of a sudden just drop that intensity perhaps? Yeah, it was. Um, we came in at half time and uh, Kenny was pretty honest about it and he, um, he, he let us know about it but um, yeah, I think they, they got out the back of us a bit and um, it was probably, probably the midfield and Backs not pushing back enough to, to man their big men, and um, they got a couple of marks and, and a couple of goals. So it just shows how um, how switch on you have to be. And um, look, we were up by five goals, as you said. And um, like that, like flipping a switch, you can you can be up, only up by a goal or two. So um, we've got to get that right and um, make sure we put teams away um, in the first half. So Ollie, just bear with us for 30 seconds. We've got some of our Sydney News Radio audience who are departing. So Port Adelaide winners by three points, 10, 12, 72 to the Demons, 10, 9, 69. We finished with two goals to Jay Shills, also to Paul Stewart and to Justin Westhoff. Meanwhile, for the Demons, Dom Tyson finished with two goals, 26 disposals for Robbie Gray, also to Ollie Wines, Cam O'Shea with 25, while for the Demons, 32 to Dom Tyson and 31 to Nathan Jones. So a thrilling win at the end for Port Adelaide, prevailing by three points. Uh, Essendon and the Western Bulldogs for some of our audience after this match. So uh, a thrilling win here at the Adelaide Oval in front of 37 fans. And we'll continue on for the majority of our audience. Uh, Ollie might have had to have ducked away, unfortunately, for recovery. So that uh, farewell coming right at the wrong time. But Ollie was one of the instrumental players in terms of the contested footy work. Both in the last quarter where Melbourne had more of the run than the power. Yet good sides find ways to win in those sort of situations. Oh, I just keep... Uh, he just keep impressing me, impresses me, Stephen, around the way a, a guy in his second year can continually win the football, and he's playing like a senior player. And 26 disposals, 15 uncontested, 11 contested, five inside 50s, nine tackles, seven clearances, and he just, and even late in the game, he was still running away from his opponent. Uh, but his uh, maturity, and he spoke, I guess, of what Dom influence and what he's been able to teach him. But uh, he's, he's going to be an unbelievable player if he's not already. Yeah, what stands out about him is, uh, you know, we see we see young kids come into the competition and have a really good first year, perhaps get under the radar a bit, and he had a mature body, so he was able to stand up to the the rigours of AFL footy. But normally that second year, all of a sudden, they know a little bit more about you, they pay you a little bit more attention, and uh, he was able to. Um, just uh, go from strength to strength this year and uh, just big and strong and uh, his ability to be able to win that contested footy is second to none and just a quick look at the, the ladder at the moment and Port still fifth on the ladder but uh, 
132.4% compared to from three mammals, 133.2. So uh, the win was so important for their top four aspirations. Well, three mammals took a massive whack yesterday, not just losing to the bottom side, but 9% uh, they lost, and uh, now Port Adelaide just 0.8% of a percent behind three mammals sitting in fifth. We'll just go through the ladder, Sydney and Geelong on 52 points. Sydney still to play in this round. They've got a massive game against Hawthorne next week. Hawthorne, Fremantle and Port on 48. North Melbourne on 40. Essendon, Collingwood and Gold Coast on 36. Gold Coast sitting in ninth spot. Then Adelaide 32 and West Coast 28. The West Coast you wouldn't have thought of a chance to play, but Adelaide in the finals that is. Adelaide definitely a chance still to make that. How about what Adelaide's last five weeks, uh, Rod and Stephen? Quite amazing who they've got coming up. Collingwood away, Sydney at home, Gold Coast away, Carlton at home and finish with Fremantle in Perth. It's a really tough run. If they drop those four points today, uh, that would have almost uh, spelt perhaps the end of their chances of even getting a home final and, and maybe, as you said, Stephen, uh, not playing finals. Well, that's quite true. That's, uh, you know, you look back on games and say, well, you know, we didn't play well, uh, we were lucky, but we got the four points and that's, I think, what they'll, they'll look back and, and say about today. You know, they had a great crowd. They were really up and about. They had uh, something, you know, important for them as, as a playing group to play for in uh, their former skipper, Dom Cassisi. So just to, to do enough to win is so important. We saw them lose a close one by a couple of points to, to Essendon a couple of weeks ago and they, they just couldn't afford to lose another another one and uh, now they uh, can lick their wounds a little bit. Uh, you would imagine Carlo will probably be back against Collingwood. Angus Monfries is another one. So all of a sudden you start to get a few troops back. We heard before the game Ken Hinckley talking about Jackson Trengove perhaps back for the Sydney game. So that's what stood out today for me. Wern Hops and um, Pedart are, are, are playing on those bigger players back there. All of a sudden they, they look a little bit more reluctant to run and, and use their flair. The same with Tommy Jonas. So when you throw Carlisle and um, and Trigo back in there, it does for them so far as they get the more run and work out on the back line. That's so important for the game. Going to be able to turn the ball over in the back and be down to the right were willing to do that and uh, Melbourne were able to put some players through the midfield and it was the Demons that were actually looking to take chances. We saw um, them in the last quarter take the ball from the back with some handball, just pretty much a made-up play, take it the length of the ground and kick an important goal. That was in the third quarter, sorry. Yeah, and uh, Jeremy Howe, it, That's it? here, Jeremy Howe is a player. So uh, that's what we're used to seeing from Port Adelaide, but uh, they'll just be thanking their lucky stars that uh, Jay Schultz is a player with the ball in his hand with uh, two minutes to go. What well, an amazing, amazing round. Sorry, gentlemen, an amazing, amazing round. We've had, uh, looked like a bit of a dud one, uh, mm -hmm. didn't we, this first half of round 18. We've had four incredible games and strange results and uh, still one game to come. Uh, we're going to shortly. Bulldogs Essendon at Docklands. That could be interesting as well. So yeah. Two upsets. The yeah. Cats won by seven points against the Giants and Port Adelaide have defeated Melbourne by three. So... Um, value for money given that there wasn't that much on offer this weekend. Just goes to show, doesn't it? And all, all the coaches have said, and a lot of people say, oh yeah, they're just saying that because they're playing one of the weaker sides. But if you don't come with everything, you're, you're a chance to get beaten. And uh, nothing could be truer said about today's game. And so, you know, the St Kilda Fremantle game, there wouldn't have been a person in Australia, even the Anthony Tucker, the most one-sided die-hard St Kilda supporter. You would have thought, oh, well, if they, if, if they kick 10 goals, you'd be happy. But to kick over 100 points and win by 50-odd against Frio is just, uh, just goes to show the mindset. Saints get their tails up, and uh, it's pretty hard to turn those things, particularly mindset thing. It's hard to turn it around in a game. Once you come with a poor attitude, you normally finish with a poor attitude. Best defensive club, what, in the last two or three years? Did you, by chance, try to do something no, John, no, please. I'm pretty happy this season with St Kilda getting the seven golden teams. So uh, to beat uh, Frio by 58 points, unbelievable. It's the uh, biggest uh, upset of the season. I guess it's rivaling the uh, GWS win over Sydney in round one, isn't it? But to win by that much is uh, incredible. Frio what, give up about 65 points a game. Might be the, the loss that, remember Port Adelaide when they won it 10 years ago, got flogged by North Melbourne a bit earlier in the season. Uh, this result by uh, almost 100 points and, and won the flag. Maybe it'll uh, kickstart Fremantle into action for the last... Uh, five to possibly eight weeks of the season for them. Well, it just shows again, sorry, Jamie, with uh, Frio, there's no Ballantyne, there's no um, uh, the big Ruckman, um, Sandlands. Uh, you know, you only have to have a couple of your really good players out and uh, things can start to go overboard. I heard a stat this morning on the way driving to the ground 
that Hayden Ballantyne has actually kicked more goals than Buddy Franklin in the last five weeks. Yes. Yep, so in terms of how important that is and how frustrating that must be for Ross Lyon to lose a player of his calibre. For, for nothing too, just for oh, a, oh, a, yeah. a dumb punch behind the play. Yeah, and listening to his press conference yesterday too, he spoke, we're a no-excuse club, and I love the way he's, he's outlook. And we had a light week. We got touched up, you know, and we will make sure that that will never, ever happen again. But, geez, the outlook there. And I, I, that's where I thought Melbourne sort of did it all right today. I thought you touched on the Stephen throughout the call. The matchups, I thought they got really right, really right. Yeah. And then you have a look at, you know, the, the Jared Pollack, eight disposals, mm. one inside 50. Matty Broadbent, 12, one inside 50. So these guys, yeah, they, they just, they haven't made an impact on a game. Really out again? Yeah. But, yeah, Jared did a terrific job on him, so uh, Paul Roos is definitely congratulated because uh, the guys were given jobs, they did their jobs, and uh, you know, there was only a couple of four players, probably Ollie Wine, Robbie Gray was another one I thought was, uh, was terrific again today, he's such a good player, and uh, probably two of those, probably the two that are pushing for all Australian owners in the foot of their probably their team. I think the method will be tested too, when you talk about clubs going into finals, they say, hey, we want to be able to play the good size lead and do to keep you on the edge, well... You couldn't ask for an any better finish. That's the way it's going to be. You'll be able to get players back in that have missed some football through injury and also they're going to be able to prove themselves Port Adelaide to make sure they finish either in the top four or top six. That's right. If they finish top four, they've done enough in the last six weeks to yeah. say that they're going OK. Because uh, the draw that they've got, you have to be going OK to win enough to finish top four. Well, let's head back down to Theodoropoulos. Uh, I've got James Froy here, lads. Uh, Jim, pretty, uh, pretty tough game. You guys had the lead and it looked like you really set yourselves to take a huge scalp here but just couldn't get it done. Yeah, um, pretty frustrating. We missed a few easy opportunities um, early, as did they, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it was pretty frustrating. The enemy uh, come from behind and get five goals down and come uh, try to harness it back in the game. We got, got back in it and uh, yeah, unfortunately we got to slip in the last quarter. I think we um, held them three goals in pretty much the last half of the game. So a really defensive effort, but um, yeah, it's just pretty disappointing to get the, the four points, mate. I'm sure, uh, no side's interested in honourable losses, but it must say a fair bit about your group that you can come to one of the most hostile places in footy at the moment and, and push one of the Premiership favourites to, uh, you know, win a goal. Uh, um, yeah, I think we have a, a pretty good record here. We really battled early in the year, and uh, it was a pretty well four game today. Um, they got on top of the ceiling in the first half, but... The boys currently fought back and you know, got our nose in front and it was good thing in, so it's pretty disappointing. How to you guys? Hey James, Rob James. I thought uh, Mark Jamar's game was outstanding. 47 hit outs today too. Yeah, he's, uh, he's been playing some good Russian. Um, I think uh, over the last few years he's had a few little injuries and um, yeah, it's probably holding him back a little bit, but he's had a great right this year and um, he's trying to play some pretty good football. Look, Jack Watts has uh, copped his fair share, but that third quarter he had... 13 disposals and three inside 50, so that's yeah. a glimpse of what he's capable of. I'm oh, definitely right, mate. Uh, you see him training every week. Um, he's got some special skills and um, he's going to be a really good player. Um, you know, I suppose he's, he's been knocked around for a bit in the media and that, but um, internally, you know how good he's going to be. And um, yeah, he, like I showed that third quarter that he could turn on and uh, hopefully he can be more consistent in his game and um, do it over four quarters. And uh, yeah, he's going to be a good player. James, it's Steve Williams. I thought some of your matchups, you've obviously done some homework and you know, Polak was certainly cut out of the match. Wind guards, just uh, the ability of your guys to concentrate. And, and keep those, you know, that match winners for Port Adelaide, particularly the, their ability to break the lines and open the game up. I thought you shut them down well and uh, did it for the whole game. Yeah, I think uh, going into the game, Ruiz is pretty switched on with uh, all the matchups and the kind of thing. Um, I think Nev Neville Jagger playing in the back pocket on the guard, he's uh, done a job, job on oh, can't speak, uh, done the job on him a few times now this year. And, uh, yeah, we have uh, full trust in Nev and get the job done. And there's no real run with Roland Pollock, but. Um, Whoever was on him was at the me, and they did a good job. And Dom Tyson, you, you gave away your number two draft pick for him, but I thought he was the best player on the ground today. Just uh, his ability to win the ball around the clearances and, uh, you know, a couple of goals as well. Uh, he's really becoming an important player for you guys. He's just a big, big frame midfielder. I um, think he gets in under and wins a hard ball for us. Um, it's pretty hard to stop because um, I don't know what he weighs, but he's probably around the 90 kilo mark for a midfielder, and so he's pretty heavy. Uh, but yeah, he's skill around the goal, and he just he's got that um, goal sense to keep him from anywhere. And uh, hopefully he's uh, gets going on for the playing some good footy the rest of the year. But um, he's had a pretty consistent year for the day, so hopefully he can keep going. James, it's Matt Clinch upstairs. We, we felt like your forward line probably structured a bit better than Port Adelaide throughout the match with yourself, Pedersen, and Chris Dawes. Do you, do you feel like that's one aspect that's really coming together well? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think we uh, mentioned it during the week. Um, 
if Callum and Trim gave out, they'd um, probably be done to So um, they had two tools and their four down, so Rizzy set out to chuck your forward. And, um, yeah, I think we tried to get the as well as we could to try to off after the one on the matchups. And I think we did that well most of the game, but um, yeah, we just couldn't uh, hit the scoreboard when we uh, carried the most. James, we appreciate you having a quick chat to us. Uh, well done today, commiserations. Thanks, boy. James Frawley joining us on Grandstand AFL. Port Adelaide winners by three points. 10 to 72 to the Demons, 10-9-69. Who has the votes this afternoon? I've got the votes, and uh, I'll uh, read them out for you if you like. Uh, <laughs> good. I'm giving one vote for the ABC Football of the Year to uh, Robbie Gray. I thought uh, he was Port's best player. Probably just pit, I thought, Ollie Wines, but uh, Robbie had... 26 possessions, 16 of those were contested. He had four inside 56 tackles and eight clearances. So uh, he was one of the real reasons why Port, who were really under par, were able to win the game. I gave two votes to Nathan Jones. I thought uh, just his his ability to run high. Kane Corns had him early and it was going to be tough, but uh, he had 31 disposals. He had 11 contested. He had four inside 50s five tackles and four centre clearances which are, are really important when the game is, is opened up and if you can get the ball out quickly from there uh, it's so important to your game and three votes for me was for Dom Tyson just uh, just being contested possession seven tackles five clearances big and strong a couple of goals to go along with that as well and uh, number two, two draft pick was swapped for him but uh, he's a big mature guy ready to play footy and uh, he's going to be a star for the Demons in years to come James Willey really makes a really good other point I was going to say he's got some look about a Josh Kennedy isn't he mm. like he, he's, I mean the number the feel, the way he gets around too and if he continues to grow and develop he goes under that left foot he gets him out of trouble a fair bit as well mm. so uh, him and Jones really combined I thought well in the centre you know one two handballs and uh we're able to get it out and certainly we're the best two midfielders on the ground. So three to Tyson, two to Jones and one to Robbie Gray. So the two Melbourne players get in the three and the two. The Port Adelaide win by three points. The individual stats tucks, was there a couple that stood out? Well, definitely a couple of the players that Stephen just mentioned. Obviously, Dom Tyson, 32. Nathan Jones, 31. I think he only had four in the first quarter, so really worked his way into the game. Rowan Bale, 21. A fantastic goal in the last quarter to uh, get the Demons back within a couple of points. Uh, Jack Viney, looking forward to seeing him play over the next 10 years. He's tough. 21 disposals of him. James Frawley and Jack Watts, 19. As Jamo said, Watts had 13 in the third term, just six for the rest of the match. For the winners, Robbie Gray, Ollie Wines, 26 disposals. Cam O'Shea, he was pretty good down back. 25 disposals for him, 16 uncontested, took 12 marks, game high 12 marks for Cam O'Shea, Brad Ebert 24, Justin Westhoff 21 disposals and a couple of goals, Travis Polk and Kane Corns 19, Hamish Hartlett 17, and, uh, yeah Chad Wingard only 4, last Hi, I'm Adam Gilchrist, Chairman of the National Australia Day Council. Would you like to say who becomes the next Australian of the Year? If you know of someone that's doing great things, why not nominate them? There are four award categories. Young Australian of the Year, Senior Australian of the Year, Australia's Local Hero, and the big one, Australian of the Year. Nominate online at australianoftheyear.org.au. The Australian of the Year Awards, proudly supported by ABC Local Radio. Good afternoon and 
welcome to Docklands in Melbourne under the closed roof for the last game of this weekend, this portion of round 18 in the AFL. It's the Bulldogs sitting 13th on the ladder against the Bombers who are 7th on the ladder. Well, what a round of upsets and near upsets that we've had. Could we get another one here if the Bulldogs could upset the Bombers? Bombers have beaten them the last five head-to-head -head clashes, but after what we've seen this weekend, you never know what might happen. Drew Morpeth with you alongside me, Adam White. The last three Whatever else, I know that uh, I know when I'm going badly with my tips and when things are a bit strange is that when my grandmother and my and that's what's happened over the last month. No, I mean, even today I sort of thought, well, you know, Port Adelaide going in against Melbourne after what's happened already on the weekend, they'll be sharp, they'll be ready, they'll win easily. Five goals up and almost lost, and, and this is the game that I struggle probably more than anything else. So I'm really looking forward to today. Start of the game, about 20 minutes away in our pre-match. We're going to uh, hear from Simon Goodwin, assistant coach for the Bombers, shortly. But uh, Scott West, proud Bulldog, seven times best and fairest. Your boys went well. Up in Queensland last week. Yeah, they were terrific, and um, you know I was self the back of some great performances from McRae and Bottom Pally and Throwback. You know, uh, we'll be out for the uh, for the next decade, I would suggest. And, uh, you know, I want to do one thing we talk about. It's now there, so, you know, the Bob Hurst and the boys and the journey. And the genius are accused of the world along the journey, and I, I, I think that's a, a really spot on call because they've really taken, taken over this team, and tonight a really big test for them. They're one of the highlights for me this weekend is to welcome back Stan Alves. <laughs> All over the places. Well, well it's great, great to be you. back with the rider, the weather. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing, but we're under the roof. And uh, look, I'm excited as you guys are, um, because coming to this, I know there's been some terrific upsets, but this was the round that probably fascinated me as much as in this game. Um, and one of the reasons I say that, and Scotty's just talked about the emergence of players, but it's been the emergence of those players now embracing what Brendan McCartney's wanted of them. Uh, I think for a period of time the kids looked okay, I couldn't understand why is, uh, you know, why is he crooked on McRae? Why is one the Well, they just hadn't grabbed what he was on about, but now they have and they're playing rightly, they're playing the brand of football which will take them forward. But also, guess what, I reckon Mark Thompson's done the same. I think Mark Thompson's now imprinted his brand on, on Essendon players and, and players who have probably been one-way players have now understood that, no, it's about getting the mix right the attack and defense uh, mix is, is really right so we've got two sides who I think are playing right at this point of time the best footy they've played all season well it's multicultural round and right out in front of us is a troop of about I don't know, 50 or 60 dancers in costume this is a hint of Bollywood India it will feel like the, the, the Delhi Commonwealth Games Drew because this is part of the multicultural round and, and Essendon have really got uh, behind India Ooh. over the course of the weekend. I think on television you can press red and you can have a, a, an Indian version of the call of today's game. Ooh. That'd be interesting. Almost, that might make more sense than we're going to make. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got the fright of my life coming in. They had Chinese dragons and all sorts of things and drumming going on as I was walking in. They extremely loud. Well, the Indian connection had completely gone through to the keeper with me, so wasn't aware of that. Anyway, it's interesting to see multicultural round prior to an AFL game. Uh, look, let's get down to uh, the boundary line without any further ado. Uh, our man on the boundary is Martin Blake, and he, a short time ago, caught up with the Essendon assistant coach, Simon Goodwin. Simon Goodwin, how's the week been at Essendon? You've obviously coming off a couple of very good wins. Yeah, we are. You know, I think the boys took a lot of confidence out of the last couple of weeks, the way they've played. And, you know, we've tried to keep the boys in it really, you know, training really well and the standards really high. And, you know, we're a footy team that wants to try and look the same week after week. And hopefully we're heading in that direction. You've had some clean air as far as the other matter that I don't even need to mention. It seems to be pretty quiet at the moment, at least externally. Uh, does that help at all? Oh, look, it's, you know, it helps for sure. You know, it's pretty quiet at the moment. But, you know, I think it doesn't really matter what happens with the boys and, and where they're at. They're, they're very resilient and they want to make sure that they just keep focusing on being a good, good, good team. And, uh, you know, that's what they've been terrific for the last two years. Courtney Dempsey's playing uh, interesting sort of a player. He's had his moments as far as injury and even discipline and stuff like that. But he's a very damaging player. Do you think he's getting better? 
Oh, look, he's a very exciting player for us. We know when Courtney plays the type of footy that we want him to play, which is a, a really defensive-based game that at the time we know he can be a really quality player for us. And, you know, he got some really interesting feedback from the playing group and, um, you know, earlier in the year and he went away and worked really hard on his game and um, he's come back the last month in terrific form. Any changes today? Yeah, look, Joe Danaher's out of the team. Um, you know, he's got a, a sore shoulder and um, uh, Corey Delolo comes in. So that'll be a bit smaller, so? Yeah, a little bit smaller in our forward half and, um, you know, we'll have to, you know, uh, utilise probably Jake Carlisle, you know, Carl Hooper and even have a terms of the way they've been playing, they've been in really good form. And as I said earlier, trying to look the same each week as a footy club and be consistently good around the ball, that plays a good defensive style of footy and, and looks like they're really smart and consistent with the way they move the ball. So we're really focused on that process and uh, hopefully that'll help take care of the game. Have you seen a noticeable change or any change in Bomber in the, in the coach's box with his intensity? on game day, it's not, not to say he was any less invested early in the year, but he just looks like he's really involved emotionally and uh, right in the game, uh, now when, the, when the, obviously the camera goes to the box. Have you seen any notice of change in him? I've really seen a noticeable change. I think what he does do is he, he brings real consistency to the group. He, he certainly drives high standards and, and game day is uh, exceptional at motivating the boys to, to deliver what we're trying to achieve and um, you know, he's certainly intense game day, but at times I can guess he can look quite relaxed as well. Are you a team that will tag inside or outside? So will uh, Hockey go to Liver or will you constantly trade on the run outside from Griffin? Is that or will you try and nullify both? Well, it was certainly, you know, I think Griffin's the player that continually, uh, you know, wins some games of footy, but we're certainly keeping a very close eye on Liver as well. His inside work's um, exceptional and, and something we're going to have to look out for. Fair to say, Jake Carlisle goes to stay for this week, mate, after nine and nine. We'll stay forward to start with, but I think, you know, the thing that we're trying to develop is that we're very flexible and, you know, if it's not working for Jake, we'll throw Michael Hurley forward, we may throw Carl Hooker forward. We're very open-minded to, to where our key position players play. Jake's uh, we've been working on just getting him to move and move in certain areas of the ground and um, you know, Mid's are starting to kick the ball to him when they're out in space so it's certainly a combination of both. Jake's now moving and uh, we're starting to kick more, uh, a little bit better delivery to him. Did you see this form coming? It's, and it's a seven week sample now, it's five wins, two losses but remember Bob was saying in the first eight weeks, don't worry we'll be okay, I'm very confident in this group that things would definitely improve in the second half of the year. Did you have that same thought process? Yeah, we certainly went into the season planning that we certainly trained them uh, differently throughout the summer. And also early in the season, we've continued to train them uh, relatively hard throughout the season. And we knew that the first part of our season was quite tricky with the draw and, and the way things were scheduled. So um, we knew that come this time of year, we wanted to be playing some of our best footy and continually improve through this part of the season. And, and so far, so good. But, you know, this footy is a funny caper, as we've seen over this weekend, that you just got to keep doing the little things right to, to keep getting the results. Yeah, this weekend certainly has thrown up the shocks. When you come off probably your best performance of the year, incredible accuracy against the Pies, is there a danger that you could come a guts of the next week? Oh, there's no doubt about that. We're, we've, as I said, f just focused in on us and making sure that we prepare in the best possible way. And um, I think if we worry about the results and, and who we're playing and, and what we're playing for... If you've been on the other side of the fence, you might have been a premiership player. Well, a lot of people ask, we're really disappointed, obviously, being a Bulldogs uh, a Bomber supporter, that you didn't go there. After mid-93, when the baby Bombers come through with Mercedes, McCurry, Fletcher, or Lorenzo, all players that I either played local footy with or against or school footy with, 
I was a little bit jealous, I have to admit, and still jealous today because I never got one and they've got two, I think. Stan, you had to go to another club and you finally got one. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, mine was a little bit different. Mine was just tap on the shoulder, you finished. You know, 31, it's all over. And uh, I thought, yeah, well, I guess you're right. Um, you know, I'd had 13 great years at uh, the club in terms of individual and play with great players, but no team success. And been lucky for me, a couple of clubs come and knocked on the door and gave me a chance to, uh, to play finals footy. So I was, I was extremely this game. And plenty of excitement about it. Of course, we're under the closed roof. It's a renowned fast track. Uh, what sort of a game are we going to get? And who do you think might have the advantage? Well, I think we're going to get a really quick game. I think it'll be offensively dominated. Uh, I know both teams uh, really want to concentrate on the defensive aspects of the game, the contested footy, as we heard Simon Goodwin say, that's one part of the game they're really worried about with the Bulldogs, and they've really turned their fortunes around from a stoppage point of view over the last uh, month and a half uh, in their performance, where early in the year they were really down on their stoppages, the Bulldogs, where last year they were terrific. Last six weeks they've been a lot better, but um, what I see is two teams, uh, or two coaches that have really put their stamp on both their own teams now. You know, we know the, the impact that Bomber Thompson's having on, on Essendon with Jake Kyle he persisted, he persisted, got his reward last week with Carlo uh, having the 19 marks and four goals. Dempsey, they're stuck with Dempsey. And you can really see Bomber Thompson's influence in the team now, apart, uh, as opposed to probably early in the year where he was it's probably looking at more of a caretaker role. He is now the coach, the modified coach of this team. And again, you see um, Brendan McCartney too. He's really put his stamp on this team where he's playing the younger players. It's nearly become his list. He's nearly turned them over as much as the, 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 uh, that he can now say, well, this is the list I'm putting together. There's only three players on the Bulldogs list that are, that are gameless under his reign, and that's, um, that, that's probably where the Bulldogs are at, trying to get as many players through to see whether they can play, to see whether they can stand up to, to AFL footy, and we're seeing that with Redpath, Robat, Honeychurch. These players, I know he's not playing today, Bogdan Pally. McRae's just been outstanding. I saw him play last week, and if you want to have breakout games, 43 possessions and, so, uh, what was it, 43 and 4? That's a fair game, Stan. A fair game. That's an outstanding game. Look, it, yeah, to me, it's uh, there are some parallels between these sides because there's no doubt that uh, the Bombers for the last few years have been an outstanding attacking side. Their problem was they could get opened up and side score against them. And I think uh, Bart Thompson's come in and he's really tried to turn that around. And, you know, we're talking about Courtney Dempsey. Courtney Dempsey's only game was just take off, run past, attack. He, he, but now he's talking, no, son, you've got to do the other defensive bit. You do that properly, get that right, and you get the balance right, and you become a better player. And I reckon they've bought in. If you go back a couple of years ago, the Bulldogs were all attack, weren't they? I mean, that was the way they played. Um, and then we got the situation where uh, Brendan McCartney's come in and he said, no, I I've got to teach you to be defensive. I've got to teach you the aspects of this game. And really, I I've got to tell you, I've bemoaned the fact that I'd watched them and I thought, when's he going to lift them off the leash? But he knew better. He knew better. No, they they're not ready to be let off the leash. And he had to get them to buy in. And in the last couple of weeks, I think they have bought in. So now we've got two sides who I think both coaches are really happy that they've got that blend right today. So I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that side again. But certainly the, the toughness, the in and under, but also when you get the opportunity, take the other side on, split them open, and then hurt them on the scoreboard. Well, Stan, to emphasise your point about Essendon, the Bombers have only had uh, opponents kick 100 points against them twice this year, Yeah. which uh, would never have been the case in the past. So that emphasises what you've been saying about Essendon improving their defensive yeah, structure. I get a lot of people say, well, why don't coaches concentrate so much on defence? You've got to score to win games. And, and and obviously good defensive structure allows you to attack um, positively as well. If you've got really good structure across the ground, your players stopping exits, uh, spread nice and evenly. If you turn the ball over, you can actually go on a counter-attack. And that's yeah. good defensive teams have got good counter-attack. And my other argument to that is we get so many players drafted who are midfielders, who are attacking players, who've always been the best players at their junior club, but they never had to play defense. So there's an element of coming into the game yeah. that they don't understand how important it is because they've always been the best player and play with ball in hand. I think there's also, uh, uh, for us oldies, um, there's that traditional thing and when somebody talks about the fence, you look at the back half, the back six, but I think the critical component is to teach your on-ballers to play both ways. And they're saying the team yeah. defence. Yeah, the team no, defence. We're playing team yeah. defence. We haven't got six defenders. And, and the great thing is that when you've got players who have that capacity to get in the back half, to put those numbers, sometimes not even to touch the ball, but to stand in places that limits the opportunities to the other side to go, but then on the break... 
can just get you on the outside. And, you know, there's a couple of great players who are able to do that. And, you know, one of, the, one of my favourite players in the competition is Young Heppel. I think Young Heppel has just got this down pat, his ability to get in the back half. He can do the tough stuff. But you watch on the break. He's on the break and he gets on the outside and does that. So he's great. And that's where I said again, that's why McRae, Bontempelli, McCartney's teaching him that aspect as well. Yeah, Heppel up to 28 possessions a game and has actually really lifted since Joe Watson's gone out of the side despite the extra attention. He's actually gone to another level. I've just, I, I got a hope. i got a hope. I, I reckon a lot of Essendon players have stepped up. I reckon they really stepped up when uh, when Joe went and we were worried about that. They stepped over even more to when Goddard was went and we, we worried about that. I just hope with Goddard coming back and then Joe when he comes back, the other blokes don't think it's now time to step back. Now, if they can maintain that level, Essendon's really well on their way. Well, they need to see there's a bonus that they're coming yes, back into the team. Because, you know, Joe, yeah. Joe, you know, obviously with the 10 weeks out, he's not going to be the Joe Watson just after pre-season coming fresh and fit into a season. He's going to be the players a little bit underdone. And Goddard, again, he's had continuity. But, again, you've got to see there's a bonus that you get these good players into your team. Well, for this multicultural round, tossing the coin out in the middle was... Tom Liberatore for the Bulldogs and the 100 game man Courtney Dempsey and Libba has won the toss and elected to kick to the Footscray end in the first quarter which under the roof there's no wind advantage obviously but that's to the left hand side of your radio dial and out on the boundary line is Martin Blake welcome to the show hello Drew hello gentlemen well it's very nice down here with the roof closed quite pleasant uh, the grounds in not bad condition a little bit of a sandy patch straight out in front of us on the dock side of the, the ground I was watching Brendan McCartney wander around in the warm up and uh, he had a warm embrace with uh, Bomber Thompson, who, of course, he worked with for a long time at Geelong and Essendon. So a lot of fami familiarity between these teams. We've got Wayne Campbell, the umpire's director for the AFL, sitting near me. I hope he's got Razor Ray Chamberlain's earpiece turned up at the right volume after what happened last week. You get a good view of those uh, Bollywood girls? No, I was wandering down. Oh, right, right, right. So here we go, Sunday twilight footy from Dockland Stadium in Melbourne to complete the first half. Immediately gets the They fight for it inside the centre square, some fierce tackles and players diving in on the footy. It will be fun. Just Boyd's been given the job on Stanton. He's gone straight to Stanton. Minson taps it out, but straight to Hoffman of Essendon. We kick the football wide towards half forward. Austin will get there first to the dogs, collects. And he's been caught on his left. He's been able to squeeze the kick on his right down the boundary. And he's out of play. Hoffman right next to Griffin. And so it'll be thrown in. And Hoffman's died to Griffin, as we thought, and Wallace to Heppel, who actually started off the back of the square for the Bulldogs and has come in and picked him up. Griffin making a return today. The throw in right below us near centre wing. Minson camped underneath it. Oh, over the top right or down to Heppel. Heppel shares it for young Merritt. Back to uh, Heppel. Fantastic play and he switches it across towards the city side of the ground. Windelick with good speed gets there. Back to Myers. The hand pass forward. And uh, on the run is Ambrose. He kicks to the forward pocket. And Carlisle continues to go where he left off last week and marks in the forward pocket. Gee, some great work by Goddard. Goddard just walked across, just planted his body and stopped. Didn't put his hands out, nothing like that, but just meant that nobody was going to jump on Carlisle. He's just able to stand there and take it. Gee, that's great. Awareness and great play. Man on the mark is only 20 to 25 metres from goal. Carlisle out pretty wide. But he must be on such a high with confidence after last week's performance against the Pies. Carlisle for the first goal of the game. Steers it home. It took less than two minutes. Well, terrific play from Hippel here on centre wing. He really uh, bodied uh, Mitch Wallace out of the way. He got three or four touches. We've got a great start for Mitch Wallace when you can get him in a chain like that. But the thing that impressed me the most has been a really good move from the Bombers and, and Mark Thompson. He's windily come out back. His speed to attack, his speed to be able to run and close down plays in that defensive end. But offensively, he's been really dangerous getting getting down that, that side of the ground. And that's how he created that from his run. And he was proactive in getting forward. And again, a really good call stand with Goddard. Really protected his man. Didn't allow the opponent to come over third man and, and an easy mark to Carlisle deep in the pocket. Winderlich's one of the, the smartest thinkers of when it comes to footy there is. And well, he takes a place of him, but yeah. <laughs> he's, and he's holding his place. 
from the restart. Liberatore got a handball out to Griffin. From, on his left, it was a rush kick towards centre half forward. It clears Bagley. So it's in a dangerous spot, only 35 metres out from the dog's goal. Comes out towards Wallace. He farms out the ball. A handball towards McRae. He was tackled. Liberatore goes in. There's a free kick. It's going to go to McRae. It was pushed after he got rid of the football. So his front right corner of the square. He kicks well up towards and finding Bontempelli. He just cruised out from full forward. Looked like Tony Modra coming out from full forward. Not a midfielder. The way he was able to move for that football and take it in front of his eyes. Well, he didn't mark it. He gloved it. Yeah, it that, wasn't a beautiful Well, that's going to be one of his advantages. He started in the centre bounce yeah. in, the, in the first bounce. And now he's pushed forward as a general midfielder with Mitch Wallace coming in to play on Heppel. But he's going to get mismatches because of his size and his mobility. 192 centimetres, Marcus Bontempelli. He shuffles in on his left. He kicks it like a full forward as well, straight through the middle. And the dogs get the immediate answer. It's a goal apiece after three minutes. Oh, just a great sign. Uh, the other side uh, has got the footy, but then the, the, the pressure, the intensity, and two young guns, firstly McRae's attack on the ball. And Bontempelli, I mean, the other thing about it is that... Um, there's a tendency of in your first year, you, you go down there, you, you're going to play a, a sort of secondary role, but not the kid. He just went down there, saw that space, came out, was a lovely low kick. But I can say this again, soft hands. But there is no such two players in the game and go out or they punch the ball. But he just gloved it absolutely beautifully. And went back to the left foot, just stuck through the middle. Great fly by the middle. Coming here today. Bounce straight up for beauty. One by Ryder. Comes to Liberatore. He's wrapped up straight away in the tackle. Tackler was Jackson Merritt. The umpire comes in to throw it in the air. Still inside the circles. Up she goes. This time Minson. But it's shark by Heppel of the Bombers. He's kick inside the 50. Chappie's there. Toes the ball out of the air. Stanton runs onto it. Gets to it 40 out. Shares it with Chapman. Stanton out wide. Goes for a little left footer. And Carlisle marks again. Well, Ruffhead looks like having a rough day if this keeps up. Well, we've seen some influential toe pokes. That's probably not, the, not one we're going to talk about in the history of the game, but it's really smart from Chapman. Just toe pokes. He was under pressure. Didn't want to take the from the ball. He was in a scrum. Just allowed the ball to go out in front of Stan. They both come all together and find Carlo again. Jake Carlo. Very similar shot to the one he was this time the near side through for a minus four. Robert Murphy kicks to himself. And then comes the dock side. He wants Minson. Ryder jumps early and uses his hands to get that extra elevation. So a free kick to Minson. Handballs to Griffin. To pick and goes back to Griffin. He's in trouble. He's been corralled by Connor. Find the loose man. It's Morris who takes it in the right back pocket. He gallops away and goes short out to half back. Yes, the dogs. The gee, the speed of Griffin then and the ability to cut sideways got him out of trouble. Great play. It goes short to Cody Stevens. Who's going to centre it up, it looks like. He's running at the moment, takes a bounce. He's not sure whether to handle or kick. He chips it back to Ruffhead. He's almost back at fullback as they switch from the city side to the dock side. Ruffhead's kick has to be good, it is. And Easton will took the mark, having to use a fair bit of uh, gas just to get there to take the mark. He squares it back into Ruffhead, still inside defensive 50. But he's conceded two marks to Carlisle already. Bombers have tightened up the defensive area. Bombers by a point early. Kick by Ruffhead. Well, Austin gets rid of his opponent, gets away with it and takes the mark. Just over half-back flank with a short pass up to the wing. And Liberatore marks. And that's the problem with going back and forward at half-back is that you allow the opposition to filter through and get one-on-one -on -one and, and really stop your flow. Liberatore's kick to half-forward. All Essendon with the numbers. And the ball hacked up the ground by Hooker. It comes to Picken who juggles but gets hold of it. Finds Roughhead. Back to Picken. Pokes the ball. Didn't go 15. Play on says the umpire. Good call. Hunter. Kicks over the wing. Mark taken there for Essendon by back coming over the top. Essendon 1-1, one, one, Bulldogs 1 goal. She improved player Bagley. Yeah, Bagley will kick down the line there. He wants Heppel against Wallace in a one-on-one. -on -one. Heppel reaches over the top. Couldn't mark good work from Wallace. 
Hunter wins support, wins it, handballs to Rovat who goes backwards to Austin. And Austin has it at left half back. So the Dogs can't get it past centre at the moment. He goes short back to Rovat. Kerry Gunnerboy. There's a couple in the team for the Dogs. He goes short. And it's Kobe Stevens again. Very slow and patient at the moment, the Dogs. Now the kick to the contest. Wants Minson against Ryder. It gets to the back. Griffin's there close to the boundary. Can't keep it in. As Hocking just nudged him over the line, so it'll be thrown in. We've played eight minutes. And the Merritt brothers for the Bombers from Melbourne Grammar. Half forward, Minson camped underneath it. Oh, Ryder gets rid of him. It comes underneath the McRae. He's rolled over in the tackle. Quick hand passes in tight quarters. Ryder's kick over centre wing. Another little toe poke by Chappie, but this time he runs out of room as he gets it towards the boundary line. He must have been watching the World Cup, I reckon. Boundary thrown just below us. Ryder Minson again will right jump in the line. Gets it down. Wins Lick misses with his kick. Wood has it. Tackled by Heppel. And this will be thrown up. And Pionicles throws it up. Third man up there was Bontempelli. He won it down well to Hunter, who was immediately tackled. And it will be thrown up. He's got some tricks in his book, Bontempelli. We just saw them. Third man up. And the advantage of playing a six foot three midfielder to be able to get up and over the, the top of the ruckman. This time it's Myers, third man up for Essendon. Tried to knock it to Zaharakis. He collects. Handballs to the run of Collier, who kicks long inside the 50. Merritt's there. Good spell there from Pickham. Away from Zach Merritt. And it's been destroyed out of play for a throw-in. 40 around from Essendon's goal. So both teams at the moment just feeling each other out. In the opening nine minutes. Ball gets thrown in, Minson and Ryder. Minson again gets the front position, taken over by Howlett, out of the pack. Kicks towards goal, it's a little bit... Oh, 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 bad bounce! Carlos in the square, picks it up, turns around, handballs to Merritt. Merritt, kick is smothered. Oh, the dogs dodge one almighty bullet there, and they can now clear. With the kick out towards the 50. Knocked towards the boundary line and helped over by Wallace for the safety of out of bounds. <laughs> Ruffhead was breathing a big sigh of relief that time. Well, he did the right thing. He came off Carlisle and take the footy. Unfortunately, with this oval ball, you just don't know where it's going to go sometimes. Terrific smother, Joe Henderson. Chance here for the Bombers. Ryder over the top once more. Wow, comes to Dalhouse. They hit him hard. Ball bobbles around inside a big pack. Myers lays a tackle. There's a high one in there. And up by Razor Ray has paid the free to Essendon. And it's coming to Ambrose. So Patrick Ambrose marks the spot, which is about 43 metres from goal. And he goes back to the top of his mark outside the 50. He comes an important player, Ambrose, for the, the fact that they're a little bit smaller down there without Mel Chambers in the team. Uh, it doesn't mean it means uh, they can't really push their run forward. He needs to get on the move and really help Carlo create space. He's about the digits of 50 and need to kick from about 47. Ambrose hoists it high and long, and it gets there. Essendon second, they're 2-1 to the Dogs' one goal. Yeah, well, he's an important player. He's been given an opportunity, played a lot of VFL football for Essendon. Uh, and obviously, as I said, with, with Bell Chambers out of the team, Ryder not being able to slide forward as much as probably what they'd like to, having to do most of the ruck work. You know, he becomes important for Carlisle because if he doesn't get on the move and his, Ambrose's man can sag off and become third man up on, on Carlisle and, and block his space, it's going to be really ineffective for, for Essendon. But if he can get on the move, create uh, one-on-ones around the ground, we know we got that from a free kick, which is a, which is a good effort. But the most important thing is he went back and kicked it. You've got to take your chances, and Essendon are at the moment. The only stat uh, differential clearances, Essendon 7, the Bulldogs 1. A big difference well, in this match. Ryder wins the tap down, Heppel knocks it in the path of Zaharakis. He weaves through traffic, handballs to Hurley, now to Collier. Collier with a handball to back lane, slips over in the middle. In trouble, got a handball back to Collier, now to Hurley. So they worked it okay. Hurley on the left, up towards Carlisle. Crashes the pack, Morris showed courage in the front though. And then won the ball, gave it to Johansson who also falls over. He's in trouble, they all sit on top of him. But the umpire will call for a throw up. Left forward pocket for the Bombers. Umpire Nichols throws it up again. Minson wins it down. There's a Sherpa Essendon free. 
It's going to Ryder in that ruck contest. Minson's not happy about it. He's arguing his case. Now he's played on Ryder. He snaps towards goal and that's Essendon's third. So Minson continued to argue with the umpire and Ryder said, OK, if you're going to do that, I'll just make my task that little bit easier. And the bomb is out by 13 points after 13 minutes. And I would suggest that's the thing that would enrage the coach. Um, look, there's that, you might give the free, and he's just said that he's put one arm out, which he did, and put, didn't allow uh, Ryder to go at the ruck. But then to argue the case and not guard the mark properly. So you've made one error and you've turned it into two. Whereas if you've just guarded it properly, there's a chance you've made it more difficult. So that's just a poor effort from a senior player and a leader. Um, and it's just an amazing situation. Tight contest, and in the space of a couple of minutes, the Bombers have kicked two goals and just opened a little gap. And yeah, Paddy Wright has made an enormous start to the game. Back in the middle for the bounce. Not too good, Razor. It's outside the circles. He's going to recall it. Approaching the 14-minute mark, and the Bombers 3-1 lead the Dogs one goal. Earlier on, what about that? Melbourne lost by only three points to Port Adelaide at the Adelaide Oval. Minson does win this hit out. Comes down to Liberatore, back to Minson, who thrashes it forward inside the 50, but a good defensive mark by Hibbard for the Bombers. Without further ado, out towards Ambrose at centre wing. Joe Anderson comes the other way. Ambrose slips over. Heppel comes in for the Bombers. Can they win possession? Now it's a tangle of arms and legs out near the city wing. And the umpire is going to throw this up. And both players slipped over Drew there. There's mm. quite, it's happened quite a bit in the first 10 or so minutes. Heppel wins a handball to Chapman. Defensive handball to Dempsey. Round the body. It's a dangerous kick back into the corridor. Dalhouse couldn't mark. Spoil came from Hibbert, but Dalhouse was first to recover. Gave the handball to Boyd. Boyd's handball is not good. Goddard cuts it off. Wins it at ground level. Gets the handball out towards Merritt. He was dispossessed. And now the ball is in dispute. Cramery crashes in against his old side. Myers wins it, though, for Essendon. Handballs to Goddard, to Hurley. They flick it around. Now Hibbard gives the handball to the runner, Dempsey. His kick was partially smothered, but Dempsey goes again. Handballs to Ryder from the 50 to full forward and Carla. Terrific work, Dempsey off halfback. Really good hands. What I've really noticed about Essendon is when the ball hits the ground, they've got two and three numbers there to be able to work it out. From a ground ball, he's all running. Uh, a running attacking move through the middle of the ground. Dempsey ball was smothered by Minson, but fired up really well. And that's been the improvement of his game, his second efforts. I reckon early in the year probably would have dropped the head, cursed, not got on with the game. But you just got to play the ball on its merits. And terrific play from Court. Dempsey off half back. Now for Carlisle to finish the goal.